Theresa May will head off around Europe tomorrow to try to get a further Brexit extension. She'll meet Angela Merkel in Berlin and Emmanuel Macron in Paris, ahead of the emergency EU summit in Brussels on Wednesday. She spent today in talks with cabinet ministers and senior Tory backbenchers. There were no cross-party talks with Labour. They resumed between officials tonight. But Jeremy Corbyn said he still doesn't know what concessions the Prime Minister is prepared to make. Our political editor, Gary Gibbon, is with me. What's going on? Why is she going to Europe? I've been told that one of the... One of the uh, Labour sources are saying that they, uh, we shouldn't get overexcited about these talks that are happening this evening. They are talks to talk about talks. And I've been speaking to some people who've been... Uh, in the room with Theresa May uh, this afternoon, a couple of people, and they say they've, she's been very clear to them, uh, Tories, uh, without being too specific who they were, um, who, who's, she's saying categorically there's not going to be a second vote, don't worry about that, no second referendum, and she's absolutely committed to an independent trade policy. Now, Jeremy Corbyn might just be able to live with the first of those, even if a lot in his party can't, but he can't really live with the second of those. And you do feel this is a process uh, that isn't uh, going anywhere fast. And you hear from EU sources that they don't think it's going anywhere very fast. And you can't help thinking they're hearing that from Labour people here who've maintained very good relations with them. You ask why is she going to uh, Berlin and Paris tomorrow? And EU sources are asking the same question. Surely, if you're serious about trying to cook up this extraordinarily difficult cross-party consensus you're talking about uh, for a way forward on Brexit, you should be here talking to Jeremy Corbyn uh, and, and other party leaders, maybe, uh, not coming over uh, to see Chancellor Merkel and President Macron. But as I understand it, what Theresa May is very keen to do in those visits tomorrow is try and avoid what happened at the last summit when I think Number 10 felt there were all sorts of uh, nasty surprises uh, in the room. Uh, the, the discussion about what sort of extension was on or offer uh, swerved and moved in uh, zigzagging directions that they weren't expecting, and they were very alarmed by that. And so what she's trying to do uh, in those visits tomorrow is to nail down some sort of certainty. But you have to say, everything we know about the Brexit process so far, it has an inexhaustible uh, supply of nasty surprises. The newest addition to Labour's team in Westminster, the winner of the Newport by-election, was welcomed to the Commons by Labour MPs today. Her leader, Jeremy Corbyn, is still in contact with the government over Theresa May's attempt to win Labour support for her Brexit divorce deal. But two days to the EU summit, he's not sounding like someone about to shake on a deal. But the problem is that the government doesn't seem to be moving off the original red lines. I've put the case forward for a customs union with the European Union, for market access and particularly for protection of rights for consumers, environment and those at work. And those have to be dynamic and guaranteed in the future. So far we haven't had those undertakings. In Dublin, the Taoiseach was hosting the EU's Brexit negotiator, Michel Barnier, Yeah, Varadkar didn't sound like he expected Theresa May to come to Wednesday's special European Council summit, having signed off a deal with Labour. We're open to extending the deadline to allow time for these discussions to run their course and come to a conclusion. In our system, that is very, very difficult uh, for Theresa May to open talks with someone like Jeremy Corbyn. Is, is not at all easy, but she is doing that because she is totally and utterly determined to deliver Brexit for the British people. Jeremy Hunt's message to EU foreign ministers meeting in Luxembourg, cross-party consensus seeking is difficult stuff and quite alien to British politics. Some here mocked Britain's erratic course over Brexit. The Briten haben aus einem Deal ein No Deal gemacht. Und jetzt wollen sie wieder aus dem No Deal ein Deal machen. Das ist wie mit der Zahnpasta. Man bekommt sie sehr einfach aus der Tube raus, aber nicht mehr drin. Cabinet ministers have been filing in and out of number 10 for talks all day. But what Mrs May will do next? Also, the executive of the 1922 committee of backbenchers. All want to know where the consensus seeking goes next, what red lines Theresa May is willing to rip up, and what kind of delay to Brexit she might return with from Brussels later this week. Tony Blair's former media chief, Alastair Campbell, joined the pro-EU protesters outside Parliament this afternoon. Many here think a long delay to Brexit 
as their best hope of stopping it. I believe that Jesus would want a referendum and allow the people to choose which way to go. And what would God want? What would God want? Jesus is God. Okay. <laughs> Give the full of people vote. Wednesday's European Council meeting could be crucial to their hopes and to many Brexiteers' worst nightmares. Well, I can speak now with Mary Lou Macdonald, the president of Sinn Féin, who's been in London today meeting with various opposition parties, and you've just come out of a meeting with Jeremy Corbyn, haven't That's you? That's right. I mean, did you get any sense from him that there is any likelihood of uh, agreement with the government? Well, I, I certainly got a sense from him that he understands from an Irish perspective the need to protect the Good Friday Agreement and the All-Ireland Economy and so on. Obviously, they're, they're resuming talks this evening, so I didn't ask for any guarantees of certainty because we're well past that. I think we know at this stage that uh, the Brexit process has been marked by a mixture of chaos uh, and indecision. Uh, so fr from my perspective, what we need at this stage is we need to land at a position of certainty and clarity. Now, the, the Labour Party is pushing the idea of a customs union, obviously, but sure. does that do it for you? Well, it, it answers the Irish question in part, but not in full. The issue for the island of Ireland has been, yes, the customs union, but also alignment with the single market. And I, I just have to emphasize that we're against Brexit. There's no good Brexit for Ireland. There's no happy ever after to this story. But the backstop, the infamous backstop, represents the bottom line. It's the least worst option. So you have to have alignment with Absolutely. the rules Absolutely. of the single market. A, a, a whole process of painstakingly considering other options that were put on the table has been gone through and concluded. And where we have landed, and where the British government, let's remember, landed, was agreement on the contents of the backstop as the bare minimum and so, the bottom line. So from your line. point of view, the deal is the right thing to do if you want to deliver Brexit? Well, is there anything better well, than the deal? Well, the, the, the only better thing is uh, for no Brexit. We, we didn't want Brexit. Brexit is a, an invention of the Tories here. It certainly wasn't an Irish construct. Uh, an opinion right across our island, uh, including in the north of Ireland, where people, remember, voted to remain. Uh, nobody wants Brexit. Brexit is bad news for us, even with the withdrawal agreement, even... even even with the, the protections of the backstop, it will still inflict damage on the island of Ireland. If somehow, through some miracle, something agreement happens and Brexit goes ahead, where does that leave Sinn Féin's primary goal, which is United Ireland? Well, uh, the island has partitioned since the 1920s. It's a mark of the colonial retreat from our, from our country. The, the border has divided our country. We've, we've had conflict. Uh, and we now happily have a Good Friday Agreement which gives us the democratic means and institutions to mediate that dispute and ultimately to remove the border. And I believe that's the direction that we're headed so in. There's, there's no doubt in your mind that in, in, in the minds of people in Northern Ireland, if Brexit goes ahead, it pushes them logically towards voting for a united Ireland if that question is put to them. Well, well, of course... So it's good for your cause, is what I'm saying. Well, Brexit's not good for anyone. So I'm not, I do, we don't have a scorched earth policy as regards Irish unity. I, I don't take a simple view that the end justifies the means. Brexit is very dangerous. Very, Brexit is very disruptive. Brexit is in open contradiction to the commitments of the Good Friday Agreement. But what I do know is this, uh, is that because of the Brexit debacle, many, many people who may have been quite, you know, lukewarm on the issue of partition and Irish unity are now looking at us through a different lens. Mary Lou Macdonald, thank you very much thank you. For, for joining us. Well, joining me now is the Labour MP, Angela Eagle. Um, are you at all clear what Jeremy Corbyn is trying to achieve? Well, I think Jeremy and his negotiating team are trying to listen to what Theresa May is saying. She decided to pivot to the Labour Party and do something that she should have done two years ago at the start of this whole process and try to find some kind of consensus to build a proper majority for what she wanted to do in the country and in Parliament. Better late than never. And so at the moment, my understanding is that those talks, uh, she, she still hasn't uh, uh, left her red lines and so really there has so to be a bit... it's good, is it? I mean, well, in terms I'm, of getting an agreement. I mean, the important thing is that 
Uh, we listen to what she says, but then the, the negotiating team say, really, we need to have a customs union and a single market process. We have to protect jobs. We have to protect our industry. We have to protect our uh, environmental standards and our working standards. And you know, make Jeremy Corbyn, again, didn't mention the idea of a people's vote or second referendum tonight in his statement. Does that concern you? Well, look, I think that we have to wait to see where we get, but it's quite clear that uh, going back for a confirmatory referendum uh, could well form a part of this process so that we can have closure in a process that has divided the country and there's still no sign, as you can hear it out there, with the sing-off. There's absolutely no sign of the country coming back together. And having a confirmatory referendum to say this is the best deal that we could come up with, what do you think, because it's very different to what you were told Brexit would be like in the referendum, there's nothing anti-democratic about that. But what is the timeline now? I mean, I, I'm sort of sensing tonight that everything is sort of slipping. Uh, you know, again, and that there's no great panic because it looks like European elections might well be on. Conservatives are advertising for candidates. Well, look, I mean, you know, I, and I, once I, that happens, the pressure's off. I, th I think the government have, have laid the order that would allow European elections uh, to happen, and that's absolutely right. Uh, again, I don't think that that's a problem if you're going to have to have a longer delay so that you can actually go back to the beginning and do this properly. So there's no need to sort of panic into a sudden agreement this week, as we well, were saying, isn't it? There's, you know, there's no need for Jeremy Corbyn to suddenly, you know, no, I, I mash nobody, the two positions together and say, OK, fine, we'll do it. Nobody in the Labour Party will be panicking. It's important that we get the right deal to save jobs and make sure that we keep those uh, economic connections as close as absolutely possible so there's no point in panicking but are you not worried that if you do end up fighting european elections you both you and the government are going to get you know a real kicking at the well, look, at the I, th I think the important thing is always with any democratic process that it's important that there's a democratic process you can't be against democracy if you think you're going to lose out in this particular round we are a democracy and there's absolutely nothing wrong with having democratic elections so you just take it you say do it. it doesn't matter because it's European elections. Look, I, no, no. I mean, the important thing is that this government have messed up for two years now, this entire process. They've got to the very end. Uh, Mrs May has spent five months trying to browbeat Parliament into agreeing her deal. She can't even get her own side to agree her deal. And in uh, the end, right at the very end, when she should have done it at the beginning, she's finally turned to try to build a consensus. About time, but she's left it a bit late. Andrew Eagle, thank you very much indeed. Uh, that's it for now from Westminster. We'll be back later on in the programme, but back to John. Thanks, Krishnan. Well, now, uh, uh, as Krishnan and Gary were discussing, there will be a busy diplomatic dance tomorrow for Theresa May to Berlin and Paris as she tries to garner support for her plan ahead of Wednesday's European Council meeting. And I'm joined... The diplomats have been under intense pressure during the Brexit process. Its civil servants are at the forefront of diplomatic efforts to ensure a smooth departure from the EU and maintain Britain's standing in the world. But some Brexiteers have accused its mandarins of being at the heart of the Remainer establishment, trying to thwart the Brexit that 17.4 million people voted for in 2016. The former Permanent Secretary Simon Fraser has made his views clear. We have looked long and hard at Brexit and discovered it doesn't work, in any form. Another night of the diplomatic service, Sir Ivan Rogers, the UK's former ambassador to the EU, maintains that Mrs May did not properly understand the EU when she triggered Article 50 and followed a negotiation strategy that was doomed to failure. He believes that diplomats have done their best to implement her red lines. The man charged with that responsibility was Ollie Robbins, a bait noir of hard Brexiteers who claim he never believed in the project. He was overheard in a bar saying Mrs May would never go for no deal so the choice for MPs was her deal or a long extension. Well, we're joined now by Sir Simon Fraser, who was a senior civil servant, rising to become head of the diplomatic service and head of the foreign office, and Julian Jessup, an economist who once worked at the Treasury and also at the free market think tank, the Institute of Economic Affairs. Julian Jessup, who do you blame for Brexit becoming the shambles that it is? 
Well, I primarily blame number 10. Um, I think if we'd started from a different position a few years ago, if we'd openly said that what we want is a, a free trade deal and prepared seriously at the same time for a no-deal Brexit, I think we'd be in a much stronger position than we are now. Instead, every single point we've blinked before the EU. Uh, the EU has pretty much run the process. We've ended up in a very unsatisfactory position. And for that, I blame number 10. And who do you blame, Sir Simon? Well, I mean, partly number 10, but I, you have to go back further. We set off on this course with a referendum without knowing what it entailed. Nobody was explained to clearly exactly what would happen with Brexit. Uh, we then had a political crisis. The Prime Minister drew a number of red lines. We haven't had outreach across the parties to try and form a, a collective position until very late in the day. So the whole thing has been badly mishandled. But in the end, the point is that the people were sold a false prospectus from the start. Could it ever have been delivered in the form that it was sold? Well, not in the form that it was, cons it was sold, in my view, because there were a lot of uh, partial or untruths. But what could have been delivered, or at least what should have happened, is a much fuller process of consultation before we went forward in, A, setting out very rigid terms for Brexit, and, B, actually triggering Article 50 without a plan. We haven't had a viable plan all the way through, and here we are at the last minute scrabbling to find a way to extend the process. Do you agree with that? Well, I don't. I think a number of... Um free market and um, pro-Brexit think tanks, if you like, have proposed solutions to the current impasse. If you look back to what people voted for, I think it's pretty clear they voted to, to leave the single market and the customs union and to come to some sort of comprehensive free trade agreement similar to but How better do you than know? what can did. Well, even though people weren't using terms like single market and customs union, they were talking about regaining control of borders, of, of laws, of money. And those things, I think, are inconsistent with remaining in the single market and the customs union. If we'd started a year or two ago from that negotiating position, I think we'd be in a much better place now. Uh, and in particular, we could have said right from the outset that we were willing to leave without a deal. We could have put more investment into preparing for no deal. As it happens, I think we're probably prepared now as good as we ever could be. I think businesses might even appreciate the, the end of the uncertainty that leaving without a, a deal would at least produce. Um, Do you blame the Foreign Office? No, I don't think the Foreign Office was, was leading on this. I, I think there are, there are other people who may be in Number 10 and the Cabinet Office, and indeed the Treasury, who possibly the fingers should be pointed at. Um, but I do think there seemed to have been an attitude right from the beginning that Brexit was an exercise in damage limitation rather than a positive chance to look at the opportunities that Brexit would create. And in the process, we ended up with something that I think so pleases nobody. Civil servants were at fault. Well, I don't actually think you can blame civil servants. And I think the idea of scapegoating civil servants for this is completely wrong and unfair. Civil servants have done their best to deliver Brexit in accordance with the democratic mandate of the referendum in a situation in which there's been very little political clarity about the type of Brexit that they were seeking. Now, Ollie Robbins led a negotiation which has led to a proposed deal. What we've discovered is that actually Parliament doesn't like that deal and actually Parliament doesn't like any deal. And at, over time, really, what we've learned is there is no good form of Brexit that the country is prepared to unite behind. You, you, you have set out that you think that the population should have been better prepared by the government, in a sense, and, and by the warring parties, if you like, given some kind of guide as to what this was all about. There are an enormous number of people who even now mm. really know very, very little about what Brexit really means, and it's your fault. Well, there are a lot of things that the, the government said in the run-up to the referendum that have turned out not to be true. For example, the, the Treasury was warning us that the level of GDP might be as much as 6% lower than otherwise than it is now. So when people say that um, people didn't vote to be poorer, I think all the evidence is that they knew what the economic risks were. Um, there's no doubt that the initial impact of the vote to leave has been negative for the economy. I don't think it needed to be anywhere near as negative as it has been. Uh, but in the longer run, once we've got through the transition phase, um, I'm pretty confident there are opportunities out there. There's still the opportunities that people anticipated when they voted, and those opportunities can still be seized. What do you think it's done to Britain's reputation across the world? Well, I think the world has looked on with amazement at Brexit. They were amazed by the original decision and even more amazed by the way we've mishandled the delivery of the decision. So um, that is a problem for us. They don't quite know what to say about it. They don't know how to engage with us because they don't know which direction we're taking. And I think the problem is the longer this drags on, the more there is damage to our influence and our reputation abroad mm. at a time when there are really important problems to be addressed internationally and indeed domestically uh, across the policy horizon. When things go catastrophically wrong in this country, we normally have 
huge public inquiries into them afterwards. Should there be one this time? Well, there's been a proposal and discussion of that. Frankly, my own view is we need to focus on finding a way forward. I think the sensible thing to do now is to extend the process, to take Donald Tusk's offer of what he calls flextension, and indeed, as Peter Oborn has said, to step back and think about where we now are and stop banging our heads endlessly against the same brick wall and getting the same result. Presumably, you too would like an extension in the sense that you'd like to claw back the ground you've lost. Well, if we are going to have an extension, I think a flexible one is, is a good idea. It's ridiculous at the moment we're going back every few weeks or even every few days to ask for an extra few weeks or months. My preference, though, would actually be to, to leave sooner rather than later with no deal if necessary. Now, I, I reluctantly come to that opinion because there's no doubt that in the short term it will be well, an economic shock. What would that look like? What without. confidence would it give people if you sign a treaty long ago, but nevertheless you sign a treaty and you just breach it and go? Well, we, we signed it, but we didn't fully ratify it. didn't go through the full well, parliamentary well, process. Well, you're but... splitting hairs. Well, I don't know, because I think if people, people looking from the outside um, would recognise that here's a deal that Parliament can't approve. Mm. Um, if we left without a deal, it would at least give us an opportunity to, to reboot the negotiations between the UK and the EU. Ideally, of course, with a new team negotiating it on right. our side. I think that would be a better starting point. And it's where we right. end up that matter, not the process of leaving itself. Well, let me try and tap your seasoned mm. diplomacy. Mm. Um, you know, you've got Macron sitting there in the shadows. Do you think Mrs May is going to get what she wants? Well, she's got, that's why she's gone. She's, gone to, she's already asked for the extension and now she's trying to fix it. The trouble is the EU said if you're going to extend further, we need to have a clear proposal from the UK side as to why we're extending. She doesn't seem to have that. Nevertheless, I think on balance the EU will grant a further extension so that we avoid no deal, which, by the way, I think would be a disastrous outcome and would not facilitate further negotiation, it would actually make it much more difficult. 